really great way to act collectively, which is what we are doing right now as youth. We're working collectively with this big, huge uh, youth movement across the world. Um, and we need to sing extra loud so that everyone knows we're starting. Okay, okay so I'm going to sing a line and, I, and then we're going to learn it together. Um, this is a song that's written by the If Not Now Collective, a group of um, by cross movement uh, leaders. So it starts, we're gonna rise up, rise up till it's done. We're gonna rise up, rise up till it's done. Nice, okay. And the second line goes, when the people rise up, let the power come down. When the people rise up, let the power come down. One more time. When the people rise up, let the powers come down. Nice, it sound great. Okay, and then the third line, and then we'll sing it all together, and we'll do it a few times, um, goes, they try to stop us, but we'll keep coming back. They try to stop us, but we'll keep coming back. They try to stop us, but we'll keep coming back. All right, let's try it from the start. We're gonna rise up, rise up till it's done. We're gonna rise up, rise up till it's done. When the people rise up, let the powers come down. When the people rise up, let the powers come down. They tried to stop us, but we'll keep coming back. They tried to stop us, but we'll keep coming back at the beginning. We're gonna rise up, really loud, rise up till it's done. We're gonna rise up, rise up till it's done. When the people rise up, let the powers come down. When the people rise up, let the powers come down. They tried to stop us, but we'll keep coming back. They try to stop us, but we'll keep coming back. Woo hoo! Oh, you all sounded so wonderful. All right, can we want us to do before we get started? More formally, can everyone raise their signs up? Yeah. Super high. Yeah. So many signs. Yeah. Yeah. Hold them up so we can get some pictures real quick. Thank you. like to respectfully acknowledge that today we are gathered on the traditional homelands of the Wabanaki, Wabanaki Confederacy. The land on which we stand, learn, and organize today is called Kushnik, and, and when settled was given the name Augusta. In recognizing that the land we stand on today is stolen land, we recognize that the fight for climate change is also a fight for dismantling colonialism and other forms of oppression. In advocating for climate justice, we recognize that indigenous people around the world have and will face disproportionate impacts due to the climate crisis and are committing ourselves to the struggle against the systems of oppression that have dispossessed indigenous people of their lands and denied their rights to self-determination. So we can keep that in mind as we move throughout the day. Um, and we're going to sing another song and do some more chants. Um, this one is a call and response song. 
Um, so I'll, all of us up here will do one part and then you just repeat it back. Okay, ready? Yeah. Woo! Woo! Power to the people. Power to the people. Because the people's got the power. Stronger by the hour. Stronger by the hour. Power. 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 Power to the people. Power to the people. Cause the people's got the power. The people's got the power. Tell me, can you hear it? Tell me, can you hear it? Getting stronger by the hour. Getting stronger by the hour. Global warming at 1.5 degrees Celsius. 
And for the past six months, I have thought about that report every single day, usually with fear, sometimes with rage, and most often with a sense of deep grief and mourning. Our climate has already warmed to one degree Celsius over pre-industrial levels, and that warming has contributed to record-breaking heat waves, wildfires, hurricanes, storms, and more. It's contributed to what they're calling the sixth mass extinction. Organisms are dying at 100 to 1,000 times the normal background level, and while the past five mass extinctions were caused by geologic events like volcanic eruptions and asteroids, this one is being directly caused by human activity, by choices that we are making. People in island nations are being forced out of their homes due to sea level rise, and extreme weather events are becoming more and more common every day, claiming millions of lives in their wake. That is the damage that we've seen at one degree. At two degrees, it gets worse. The droughts intensify, the heats get hotter. Uh, biggest cities in the Middle East and South Asia are going to become uninhabitable. 10 million more people are going to lose their homes to sea level rise. Three degrees has been described as outright chaos. Four degrees as incompatible with organized society. If we do nothing, if we continue on our current climate trajectory, we are going to be alive. The young people in the audience are going to be alive here when we hit three or four degrees. Now, as our natural resources grow scarce, as our crop yields decrease, we are going to be seeing the largest refugee crisis that we have ever seen in the history of humanity due to the climate crisis. Now, that's the bad news. But the good news is that there's still hope. We can still do something to stop this. The IPCC report provided us, they told us, that if we take action right now, if we decrease our emissions by 50% in the next 10 years and go to net zero by 2050, we can stay below 1.5 degrees Celsius and have some hope for our future. Now that kind of, ch yeah, cheer for that. It's awesome. Now here's the thing about that. The type of changes that we would need to make in order to stay below 1.5 degrees would require, in their words, rapid, far-reaching, and unprecedented changes in every aspect of society. We have 11 and a half years to cut our global emissions in half. And let's be clear about that. Anything short of the goals the IPCC has laid out is tantamount to genocide. We need to treat the climate crisis like the emergency that it is. Elected officials who proudly proclaim, I believe in climate change, climate change is real, but think that they can negotiate it as if it is possible to negotiate with physics, do not deserve our respect anymore. They do not deserve our applause. There's gonna be people who tell you that climate change is real, we need to support it, but it needs to be a market-based solution. The technologies like carbon capture and geoengineering are going to save us, or that proposals like the Green New Deal are unrealistic. They are lying to you. If your elected officials are shying away from the Green New Deal, if they do not have a plan to cut our emissions in half by 2030, ask them directly why they don't care about your future. The Green New Deal, a rapid mobilization of our workforce to create a just transition to a sustainable new economy, it is our only shot at avoiding climate catastrophe. It has the potential not only to limit global warming, but to allow us to reclaim our democracy and have a better future. Now, critics are gonna complain that the Green New Deal would be too expensive. Now, putting aside for a moment that climate change would actually end up costing us more than a Green New Deal would, let's ask the more important question. What price are we willing to put on human suffering? What kind of hellscape do we live in where we know how tragic and deadly climate change can be? We know what we have to do in order to avoid it, but our elected officials run away from the solutions because for some reason it is more important to them that the corporations who got us into this mess can continue to turn a profit. Now listen, carbon capture is not going to save us. The private sector is not going to save us. And if we want to have an honest conversation about the climate crisis, we need to acknowledge that our current economic system, capitalism, is fundamentally incompatible with a healthy planet. <laughs> capitalism requires growth, and it rewards companies like ExxonMobil that grow the most, regardless of the social and ecological destruction that they cause along the way. We cannot grow infinitely when we live on a planet with finite resources. And if we want to stay below 1.5 degrees, we need to get comfortable with the idea of degrowth. We need to demand that our solutions be at the scale of the problem. Our house is on fire. And when your house is on fire, you do not go around proposing a 50-year strategic sprinkler implementation plan. You do not negotiate with the arsonists or use market incentives to convince them to give down their matches. And you do not ask the fire department to only extinguish half the house because maybe extinguishing the whole house would be a little too expensive. 
when your house is on fire, you do everything in your power to put that fire out. Now, right now is the most crucial time in the history of the environmental movement. And what we do in this next decade is going to determine the fate of civilization for centuries to come. That is terrifying. If that makes you afraid or depressed or sick to your stomach, you are not alone. But we all have a moral obligation to remember what is possible and to demand that our elected officials do their jobs. This isn't a problem any of us can tackle on our own. We need to work together. And that's why I want to tell you really quick uh, to finish out about the Sunrise Movement. Cheer for the Sunrise Movement, they're awesome. The Sunrise Movement is an organization that is building an army of young people to take on the climate crisis and fight for a Green New Deal. They need our help. I know that it's easy to feel powerless, especially there are so many of you here who are not old enough to vote yet. You'll get there eventually, I promise. But especially considering how powerful the forces are that we're fighting against. But if we band together, we are a million times more powerful than the sum of our parts. So if you want to be on the right side of history, and if you want to look back in 50 years and feel proud of what you helped accomplish to have a better world for everyone, please join the Sunrise Movement and keep fighting for a better world every day until we win. And the very last thing, if you have a cell phone, go ahead and take it out right now. Text the word sunrise to 72345. Again, that's the word sunrise to 72345, and they'll plug you into the next steps. Thank you all, you rock, for being here. Awesome. Thank you so much, Cody. So up next, we have Kiara Frickin is 18 from Los Angeles, California, and a freshman from the University of New England. She helped plan one of the largest cleanups in the state of Maine, and is campaigning to get Maine off single-use plastics. Hi, everyone. I'm really cold, first of all. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm here to tell you that Climate change isn't going to hit us in 12 years. It's not going to hit us in five years. It's hitting us now. And there are millions of people across the world facing the consequences already. I'm from California. And I've always known the dangers of fires. But ever since I hit high school, they've been getting worse and worse, growing only more and more destructive. December of my senior year of high school, a series of fires broke out throughout California. And my mother and I were told to prepare to evacuate, which means you pack a go bag, you place it by your door, and if the fires hit your area, you grab that go bag, you leave, and you don't look back until you know you're somewhere safe. In that moment, I had to stand in the middle of my room and think, what's worth saving from a fire? What do you pack when you don't know if you can come back to your home or not. That question is something that hundreds of people in California have to ask every time the fires start getting bigger, every time we hear about the drought getting, big, getting larger. On the other side of the world, my mom is from the Philippines, a country made up of 7,000 islands in Asia. And we all know that as global warming is occurring, the ice caps are melting, which only means that the water is rising. So thousands of people who are living on the waterline in the Philippines every day, their homes are being washed away. And not only that, but the typhoons are growing more deadly and, more, and they're only occurring more frequently. Climate change is affecting so many people right now. And so many people are losing their livelihoods their sense of community, and in a lot of cases, their lives. I've seen with my own eyes how these typhoons are hitting people, and I've been there in the aftermath. And I've seen communities that have no way of getting aid because the roads are blocked by, deb by debris. Trucks after trucks of aid are standing or parked on the side of the road because they simply can't get through. This is why we need action now. <laughs> this is why we need to march, to rally, to advocate and fight for a greener future because no one should have to lose their home to climate change. 
No one should have to lose their home to a fire, to a flooded river, to a typhoon, or any other natural disaster caused by climate change. We are the change. We are the change, and because of that, we need to tell our politicians, our legislators, and our president that this is our future and we need to fight for it. Thank you very much. Let's hear it again for Kiara, Bowtie speaker. So, we are standing here as 20 schools from across Maine and over 350 people are here today. Let's hear that. That's amazing. We're all here together and that's what's, that's what's so amazing and it's making an impact. Um, they are hearing us in there um, and we want to make them hear us again. So here's another um, chant. Your part in this, I'm going to say something and your part is stand up, fight back. Um, so these this is a chant kind of recognizing that the climate crisis is an intersectional issue. It, um, it's kind of an umbrella issue that escalates all of the forms of injustice. And we'll be hearing about that more later. So when the air we breathe is under attack, what do we do? Stand up for the Nice. When renewable energy is under attack, what do we do? Stand up for the When the earth and people are under attack, what do we do? Stand up! When people of color are under attack, what do we do? Stand up, fight back! When uh, the water we drink is under attack, what do we do? Stand up, fight back! When indigenous communities are under attack, what do we do? Stand up, fight back! When the air we breathe is under attack, what do we do? Stand up, fight back! When, pe when, oh, sorry. when marginalized communities are under attack, what do we do? Stand up, fight back! When the water we drink is under attack, what do we do? Stand up, fight back! When the youth of the world are under attack, what do we do? Stand up, fight back! Woo, thank you! And let's do, let's, let's do this one one more time. Because what do we want? Why are we here? What do we want? And when do we want it? Now! What do we want? Climate justice! When do we want it? Now! Thank you all so much for being here. We're going to keep going with some more speeches. I just have to say, these young people up here and all of you are so amazing to be standing out here right now as it's cold and we're starting to get a little wet, but just hearing the emotion and the power in all of our voices is incredible. So, we have even more amazing people coming up. We have Emma Sawyer, who is from Portland, Maine and goes to the University of Southern Maine. She is majoring in environmental planning and policy with minors in economics and applied energies. She is president of her school's environmental student group and is interning with the Office of Sustainability. And I'm guessing she is going to be an incredible leader and already is with all of those degrees. So, Emma Sawyer, please. Can I take this off? Can I? Yeah. <laughs> You've got it. Thank you. Woo! I'm, I don't want to bend over. <laughs> okay. Hi. Thank you all for coming also before I start. It's really nice. I know it sucks out here right now, but we appreciate it. Um, so yeah, thank you, Iris, for just going over all of the things that I'm doing. And I want to talk about one of the most important things that I've learned through all of that, whether it be school or work or everything, is that everything is connected. There is no such thing as a single issue, a single issue struggle because everything is interlinked, all problems, struggles, and oppressions are interconnected. And that includes all of this environmental stuff too. Um, we see environmental problems more, or disproportionately affect poorer communities, um, communities of color. It's a really big problem. On average, native communities, poor communities, other communities of color have a much smaller carbon footprint and environmental impact than a lot of other communities, 
Yet, it are, it's these communities that are subject to more pollution from surrounding communities, businesses, industrial operations, and municipalities. So not only are these um, issues and environmental problems worse for poor people now, but it's only going to get even harder and harder. As we see this climate change happen, as we see this progress, oil prices are going to rise, there's going to be commodity inflation, it's going to be harder to heat our homes, pay for food, everything, and that's going to be 10 times harder for people who are poor now and already struggle to do that every single day. And even beyond all of these economic and class, sorry, my hair, um, even beyond all these economic and class issues, there's a lot of environmental racism that's happening and has happened for hundreds of years and is still continuing today that needs to be addressed. And yeah. <laughs> Environmental racism is alive and well as long as kids in ethnic communities in central LA have only a third of the lung capacity of kids in white communities in Santa Monica. Only one third the lung capacity. Environmental racism is alive and well as long as natives communities are not allowed to fish in the rivers that they have kept and cared for for centuries because of pollution from private businesses that's being allowed by our governments. <laughs> Environmental racism is alive and well as long as native communities are not allowed to govern the land that they have kept sustainably for hundreds of years because it has been stolen and ruined. So I just want to remind everybody that these issues, this environment stuff, it's important, but it's also a lot bigger than just the environment. And I don't want you to fight for environmental justice and renewable energy and sustainability just for the sake of the environment. I wanted you to do it for yourself, for your future, and more importantly, I need you to stand up for this for the people who don't have a voice or don't know better or don't have a platform and aren't able to speak up and talk about these issues that are affecting them even more than some of us. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Emma. Up next, we have Quilla Fanagan. Bert, who is a senior in high school and from Portland, Maine, and I just have to say, she is wonderful. She's an inspiration. So like she just said, my name is Quilla Flanagan Burt, and in March I turned 18 years old. In my 18 years of living in Portland, Maine, I've witnessed changes in our seasons, from heat waves to heavy downpours, and I've read of rising sea levels. These erratic changes aren't just odd weather. They're a warning. We need to act for climate justice and move towards a greener economy now. There are a few things that jump to mind when someone says Maine. Pine trees, lighthouses, lobster, fishermen. We are a state crafted around our natural resources and are dependent on the health of our local and global climate to survive. We do not just want a transition towards a greener economy. We need one. Our local coastline is in a high risk situation already. With a, uh, with a report from NASA stating, in the past three decades, the Gulf of Maine has warmed by 0 0.06 degrees Celsius per year, three times faster than the global average. This statistic puts the Gulf of Maine warming faster than 99% of the world's oceans. But more is changing than just our water temperatures. Climate change is actively sinking the local fishing industry, destroying the livelihoods of fishermen, and drilling away at the foundation of one of the largest contributors to Maine's economic security. Native species like lobster and cod are rapidly moving northward in search of cooler waters, and invasive species like green crabs are moving in. Research by Cornell University states these crabs alone have the potential to destroy the balance of Maine's marine ecosystems. A study of economic impact completed in 2016 by Colby College and the Maine Lobster Dealers Association showed the lobster industry alone generates nearly 4,000 jobs throughout the states and contributed nearly a billion dollars towards Maine's economy. Now think about our waters warming and our lobster populations disappearing. Fighting climate change is not a want, it's a need. <laughs> Our 
representatives fail to acknowledge the changes already happening and the risks in our near, near future. They fear they'll lose money as they adjust Maine laws to make it a greener state. Obsessed with saving money for a future we will not have unless we address the issues of climate change now. <laughs> climate change is the biggest problem our world has ever faced and we as a collective must find the solution. Buying local food transported 25 miles instead of 2,500 miles is part of the answer. Taking the bus, carpooling, and riding your bike instead of driving alone is part of the answer. Striving to live sustainably every day is part of the answer. But calling upon policymakers, stockholders, and large corporations for more sustainable practices is what we need to do to trigger the large scale changes we need now. time to push those in power to fight for the planet rather than profit. We must educate ourselves, our friends, and our families, acting as individuals and as a collective, to dismantle the walls of willful ignorance which plague the systems of American government. Passive opposition to climate change contributes to the problem. If we fail to use our platforms and our power, each opposing vote becomes as powerful as two. It is our job to speak for those who cannot speak for themselves. We must fight for a just transition and protect those in our own communities who are disproportionately affected by climate change. Low income communities, people of color, frontline workers like our lobstermen, and indigenous people are often both most affected and most silenced. A greener economy in Maine does not simply entail emission reductions or abatement of some of our most profit-driven practices. It is a complete overhaul of the systems we have in place. For an economy focused on clean energy and sustainable waste-free practices, we must rebuild from the ground up. Yet this rebuilding will pave the way for healthier communities and shared security throughout Maine. A greener economy will help us break down the divisions forged by concentrations of entrenched economic powers and redistribute resources away from billionaires and back to our local businesses and people. <laughs> this transition will be long and arduous, but it is a necessary part of Maine's growth as we continue forward and embrace the current climate crisis and create opportunity. Though it may initially include sacrifice, a greener economy will help foster economic security, equal opportunities for all people, affordable energy, improved transportation services, and overall healthier communities. Yeah! Maine should not deny, fear, or downplay the facts of climate change. Instead, we should accept, confront, and embrace the opportunities to do the right thing as a state and a populace. Dear ago is Maine's Latin motto, I lead. Let us lead the nation with a green deal. Let us lead the nation. Let us lead the nation with environmental justice. Let us lead the nation to renewed hope. Thank you. Thank you. So I know it's getting chilly, so please feel free to move around a little bit, do a couple jumping jacks, whatever you need to do to stay warm. Um, up next, we have Hale Maurice, a junior at Bowdoin College. She has been working with the Sunrise Movement and has been doing some incredible stuff with that. So welcome, Hale. Hey, hey, okay, y'all have been listening to a lot lately, um, and and y'all are cold, so why don't we, like, just take in this, like, movement that's going right now? We can do a little, um, there's this little, like, stretch and move routine for those who are able that's just really nice to really connect with each other, so um, I'm going to yell and put the mic down, because I don't know if this is going to work, or maybe we'll, maybe we'll try with the mic. Okay, so, so... Maybe spread out a tiny little bit from each other, get some space. And if you guys want to come up here, we can all do this together. This would be great. Sports mode. Well, we're leaving eco mode. All right, have we got some room? 
All right, so we're gonna reach up high. Yeah, we're reaching to the top. Here we are today at the state capitol. And we're here with our state legisla le le legislators and we're demanding bold solutions that need to be implemented at the top. But how are we gonna do that? We gotta go down to the grassroots. There we go, we're at the grassroots, we're talking to some people, we're recruiting our friends, we're building the movement, there we go. And you know what, then we stand up, we got our movements, and here we are, we are over on the left. <laughs> Historically speaking, in 2019, that was not the case in the 1970s, but 2019, we're over here on the left, but you know what, we're going to go across, we're going to reach in the middle, we're going to reach out to those people that, you know, they support us, but they're not here. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to pull them to the left. We're going to pull them to the left. And then we're going to go even further to these people that are like, is climate change real? And we're going to be like, yes, and this is our futures, and we're going to pull them to the left. And we're going to pull them to the left. And we're going to be like, all right, hello, the right. We got 12 years, the IPCC reports, give us 12 years. Here's a handshake, we're gonna make this happen, thank you. Um, and that's how we're gonna do it. Um, what else are we gonna do? We're gonna, we're gonna jump, we're gonna have some excitement. We're gonna sing more. We're in Maine. There we go, nice and low. All right, I'm running out of ideas, guys. What else are we gonna do? Anyone got ideas? We're gonna, we're gonna pop. I don't know, we're just, we're gonna pop. We're gonna be like, hey, we're over here, and we're also over here. We're in the cross building. Now we're on the on the steps. We're back in our communities. We're everywhere. Yes. And then we're gonna stop once we stop climate change. Once climate justice becomes a thing. Once we have the Green New Deal. And then it'll become summer, and we'll be warm and not cold all the time. Okay, great. That was awesome. Thank you guys. All right, and if we want to come back together, that would be awesome. Also, like human bodies warm, it's really nice. All right, and just real quick so people can hear me, when I say climate, y'all say justice. Climate! Justice! That was great. <laughs> okay, so I don't want to take up too much of the time in my story, but I do want to talk a little bit about why I'm here and why I'm fighting, because I want you guys to talk about that for a second in just a moment. So, um, I'm here because of my body. Um, I have type 1 diabetes, which means um, an uh, important organ in my body doesn't produce this thing called insulin that I need to live. Um, and as a result, so I have like this little like insulin pump thing that's on my body um, and I kind of like consciously regulate that um, and it keeps me alive. I need insulin to live. Um, and insulin requires refrigeration um, in order for it to continue working over time. Um, and so it's really important that no matter where I go, I have access to a way to refrigerate my insulin so that I can keep it cold, so that I can live. Um, and I never really fully, like, like what climate justice really means never fully hit me until a year ago. Um, I was in Puerto Rico for two months working with a hurricane relief organization in a area of Puerto Rico that had not had electricity for four months when I got there after Hurricane Maria in September 2017. Um, I was there for two months. By the time I ended, this community still did not have electricity. And some places in Puerto Rico did not get electricity back until over a year later. What that means for a person with a body like mine is that you don't have the basic utilities in order to live. In 2019, in a place that is a part of the United States of America, that should not be happening. <laughs> Climate
Climate justice means protecting the lives of people that are most at risk. And the people of Puerto Rico with bodies like mine were the most at risk. And it's really, really unfortunate and horrible that it took so long to recover from that tragedy, from that hurricane. So I, I'm here for my body. That is what brings me here um, every day, every single day. And I want to take this moment for everyone to kind of be able to reflect on what it is that brings you here, what it is that you are fighting for, um, and what brought you here today. So we got some time. So if you can break up into groups of two, three, four, whatever that is, some people around you, I want you guys to be able to talk to each other. Why, why are you here? What brings you here? What are you fighting for? Take like two minutes and discuss with your people around you. Collect real quick, when I say climate, you say justice. Climate! Justice! I really like that. Okay, um, okay, so there's unity when we all come together. So just think what you guys just talked about. If you can condense what brings you here down to three words or less, real quick. Brighter future. Hold on one moment. On the count of three, we're all going to say it out loud together. What brings you here? All right, ready? One, two, three. That was awesome. Great. So, all of these different things bring us together for different reasons, but rea in reality, we are all fighting for the same thing. And we are fighting for a better future. And young people across the world have been doing this. And finally, our leaders are listening. <laughs> Sunrise Movement, in about a, a matter of two months, made the Green New Deal a litmus test for how progressive a presidential candidate is. And now every single Democratic candidate for president has endorsed a Green New Deal. <laughs> young people that did that in March 15th let's see where's where who here went to a climate strike on March 15th let's get some hands yeah yes March 15th 1.4 million people across the world young people striked they left school and demanded change and it happened and here in Maine we are building the movement to do the same thing hundreds of us were there March 15th We've been to our senators' offices demanding that they support a Green New Deal. We are here today demanding that our state legislature take the action that we need and be a leader in this movement. And we are so, gra so glad and grateful that they're here to listen. But we need to make sure going forward that the listening and those sentiments turn into action. So let's do this and let's hold these people accountable. They are our leaders and we have 12 years. Thank you guys.
Jenna. Oh, thank you. Welcome to the State House. Welcome to Augusta. I like to say, mi casa is su casa. This is your place. This is, uh, you are always welcome here. And I love the message. And I welcome you and your help and your advocacy. We are fighting climate change now. We are not giving up. We're not going to say no to anymore. We have got to mitigate further climate change. We've got to mitigate what's happened so far. We're going to look at ocean acidification. We're going to look at the changing lobster habits and, and, and geographical areas. We're going to look at the sea, seafood issues. We know that climate change is happening. There's no reason to question it any longer. We know it when we see the rising asthma rates. We know it when we see the tick infestations in our public parks and our woods all across the state of Maine. We know it when we see the lobsters moving north and east. We know it when we see the shellfish contaminated with acidification. We know it because 50% of our carbon emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, are from transportation. We're going to be electrifying vehicles and making, and making sure people have those options. And we are part of the United States Climate Action Team. Whatever the federal government does or doesn't do, Maine will be in the forefront of addressing climate change. We would have to prevent further climate change impacts and mitigate what's already there. And that means electrification generation. That means transportation issues. That means heating, home heating, business heating changing the way we do things. It's going to take some time, but you know and we know that change is going to come. And that's why later this week we'll be announcing our bill to establish a climate change council that will include a young member, at least one young member, to join in the conversation and the action to address climate change. It is complex, but we are ready to Give it our best effort, and I know you are too. So, I want to welcome you here to the State House grounds, and I hope you come back and fight for what has to happen next. There's so many things for us to do together. I look forward to working with you in addressing. Oh, I love the signs. I love the signs. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your advocacy. I look forward to working with all of you in this incredibly important issue. Now, I have a special guest, our distinguished member of Congress, Shelly Pingree. Thank you. Aren't we excited to finally have a governor who cares about climate change is going to do something about it? It's about time after eight years in Maine of not being able to work on this and move it forward. Uh, I'm just so excited to be here with the governor to know that she's going to have a plan uh, to deal with climate change, whether it's making sure we reduce our dependence on fossil fuels, getting more electric cars, uh, retrofitting our buildings, working with agriculture and forestry, everything across this state, and making sure that we are all focused on climate change. And I'm really proud to represent um, the state of Maine in Congress, half of the state of Maine, and I am honored to be working on the climate change issue on all of your behalf. Thank you so much to everybody who begrudgingly took some time off of school, so thank you for giving up a day of school. And I know there are, there are students here from elementary school to college, I see Unity College and Bates College and College of the Atlantic, and we're just really proud of you. I am so proud to have young people who are, who are pushing everyone and saying, you know what, this is our future, and how dare you turn your backs on our future, we cannot do that. So thank you so much. You are our leaders, and I am very proud to represent you. I, uh, I am lucky enough to serve in, uh, in Congress. I serve on the Appropriations Committee, but more importantly, I serve on the Interior Appropriations Committee, which has oversight of the EPA. And as you know, this president has been dismissing the EPA and cutting their budget, has no understanding of how important this is. Boo! And we're going to 
going to put that money back. We're holding climate change hearings. Uh, Congress is off this week, but we've already started talking about reducing our dependence on fossil fuel, about retrofitting buildings. I'm on the Agriculture Appropriations Committee, and we've already had our first committee hearing about how farmers, farmers in states like Maine, can sequester carbon in the soil and be part of the mitigation effort in moving us forward. I was a very early and proud co-sponsor of the Green New Deal. And just this week, we re released our companion plan to talk about agriculture and the Green New Deal. But we are strong supporters, and we are working with our colleagues, and just really excited to finally have a Democratic majority back in the Congress so we can work on these issues again. So I will look forward to continuing to work with all of you. Thank you so much. This is, this is the struggle of all of our lifetimes, and it is all about our future. And no place has affected more than the state of Maine and what's going on in our ocean right now. We are ground central about all this, and we all have to be working hard at it. There is no more time for denying this. This is about our economy. This is about our culture. This is about everything going into the future and our way of life. So I'm, I'm here with all of you, and I'm just so honored to be in your presence. Thank you so much for showing up today. Thank you, Congresswoman, Congresswoman Pingree. Uh, my favorite sign. There is no planet B. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to our wonderful guests, and thank you to everyone who's been standing out here in the club some demands that we have come up with and some asks that are really important. So the first one is we the youth of Maine demand that legislators, corporate leaders, and all of the people in positions of power commit to taking the necessary action to mitigate and adapt to climate change on the time scale that science and justice require. Yeah! legislators in this state publicly recognize that climate change is an issue that is currently happening and exacerbating existing inequalities, both globally and locally. We demand that legislators listen to and lift up marginalized and youth voices in the decision-making process, especially where the future is concerned. We demand comprehensive climate education in our schools. We demand a Green New Deal that prioritizes climate, social, racial, and economic justice, includes enforcement mechanisms, and paves the way to a sustainable society. We demand a just transition to 100% renewable energy by 2030. You guys all like those demands? Yeah. Follow, follow Maine Youth for Climate Justice on Facebook, at Maine Youth for Climate Justice on Instagram, and at MYCJ underscore Coalition on Twitter. All right, thank you all so much for coming. And there's a couple things that I wanna let you know about before you disperse. Um, first, if you are wanting to, if you have a scheduled legislative or political leader meeting and uh, you want to meet in the State House um, with an ad adult ally, in the State House Welcome Center is where folks will be meeting up. Go through the security and grab some pizza in the Hall of Flags and then start lobbying if you want. And you can also head back to the Cross Building for the Green New Deal hearing where there will be food and an overthrow ro overflow room. Um, and really, I'm encouraging you all to testify today for the Green New Deal. Look at our demands and continue to follow the main youth for climate justice and keep doing what you're doing. Keep showing up. Have the courage to continue. Because you're just taking the steps to come here is taking action.
action, taking the steps in your schools, in your communities, on an individual level. This is what our country needs right now. This is what is happening all around the world. Thank you so much and have an amazing afternoon. Yeah.